Coming up on this episode of Photography Online, we do a fashion shoot on the Leica SL2, we get close up to small birds, and we introduce you to a location you never knew about. Grab a drink, take a seat, the show's about to start. Welcome to part one of our March 2021 episode of Photography Online. As always, we've got loads of exciting content to get through over the coming half an hour, including joining Dr. Nick for another surgery session as he examines more of the photos you've been sending in. That's coming up a bit later, but let's get things off and running in style. Photography Online expert Marcus was recently loaned the Leica SL2 camera and a collection of lenses to try. So, as well as taking in a few epic landscape scenes, he also took it along on a fashion shoot to see how it performed. We tagged along to see what happens when you combine a camera review, yoga, snow and a flat tyre. Well, I'm hooked. I was recently invited to test the Leica SL2 camera with a host of lenses to see what it's all about. With a fashion shoot for a local clothing company needing to be done, I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to test out the camera and a couple of fast primes. Skyskins is a local family-run business here on the Isle of Skye, who, as well as tanning their own sheepskins in craft-sized batches, also stock a range of Scottish Highland design clothing. They needed a few new shots of their latest products, so, armed with items and model, it was time to see how the Leica SL2 performed. In keeping with the traditional Leica styling, the camera looks clean and uncluttered, with most functions only available from within the menu. You can now get third-party lenses in the Leica L-mount, such as the art range of glass from Sigma. This is great news as it opens up the demographic for who this camera might appeal to. No longer do you need to spend thousands of pounds per lens, even though it's often worth it, you can now get great lenses for a reasonably affordable price and still walk around with a camera which has a leather strap. So if you do want to spend lots of money on top quality glass, you've got the option to do that. Um, this is a 50mm f1.4 Leica lens. Um, I don't know the price, don't really want to know the price, but you can tell it's expensive. There are, however, plenty of lenses to choose from for portraiture and landscapes, with both Sigma and Panasonic now making lenses for the L-mount system. All right, go on, give me one of your trademark smiles. Because uh, Cloud is wearing a, a black gilet which has got a woolen texture, it's very important that we don't lose that texture. So I'm exposing for the shadows as you can see from the histogram there and right over to the left hand side um, and the highlights I'm just ignoring. In fact it helps to just keep the image clean when it's all blown out like that. But the important thing is they're all looking sharp so when you use a new camera it always takes a little while to get the confidence up that it's going to focus properly. Uh, but when I zoom in on these, um, it looks like it's doing a pretty good job so far. So one of the things I never do is use back button focus. Um, and this is the perfect example of why I don't do that. Um, I always use the, the shutter button to confirm focus. And I haven't touched this camera and just by half depressing the shutter button, I'm able to lock on to the model's eye um, and then recompose if necessary before I press the button all the way down to confirm focus. And that's the same on any camera. Whereas if I'd use back button focus, I'd be all fingers and thumbs at the moment, not knowing where to go, which button to press. So um, for workflow purposes, I always keep the routine exactly the same. So you just pick up any camera and it will just work exactly as you want it to do. So 
what we're going to do here is we're going to do a, a walking shot. I'm going to test the um, continuous focus because everything I've done so far has been static. So I've just been using a single focus point and then locking the focus. So here we're going to try a continuous focus where um, Cloudy will walk towards me and I'll track backwards, but we'll need the camera to constantly focus because the distance will change. So we'll see how we get on. So I just tried to uh, record in high burst mode and I got a message saying the battery was insufficient to record the, uh, even though it's half battery, just saying it was insufficient to record the burst to the buffer. It's a bit concerning, but anyway, we'll go back to low speed then. Just interested to see how well it's locked onto the focus. So that one's nailed. That one looks good. That one looks good. That one, not so good. That's not pin sharp, but it's okay. That's pin sharp. It seems to be getting, I don't know, 80%, 90% sharp. The sharpness was also helped by the in-body image stabilization, which offers five and a half stops of steadiness. So one of the things that's very important to have on a photo shoot is the preparation to be prepared for any eventuality. And here we have the perfect example. So, We've arrived on the chute and we can't go any further until I change the tyre. And of course, it's now raining, the spare tyre's under the car, it's snowy, it's slushy, it's horrible, but you just got to get on with it. So we found the perfect scene for a sky skin chute. It's time to start looking nervous, ladies. The first obstacle was getting into the field, which, judging by the barbed wire and sign, wasn't very welcoming, but hey, what could possibly go wrong? Okay, just walk towards me. Oh, the sheep are on the rampage. Must be the bull. <laughs> so, um, we're going to do um, a kind of a hero shot here trying to sell um, the Sky Skins main product, which is their sheep skins. So we've got a traditional kind of recognizable sky background of the McLeod's Maidens, which are all snow capped at the moment, so they look really good. Um, and then we're gonna get our model Cloudy to do some ambitious yoga poses. In hindsight, doing a handstand on uneven ground covered in snow maybe wasn't the best idea. As you would expect from the Leica brand, and especially a 47 megapixel full frame camera, the whole camera oozes quality from the moment you pick it up to when you see the images on a high resolution monitor. Image quality is superb. The detail is excellent and the tones are rich and smooth. Now I've been using this camera over the past few weeks in a variety of situations, and I would say that it's more set up for landscapes and portraiture than it is for say sports and wildlife. I also tried it with astrophotography and didn't get on particularly well with it, uh, purely because I found it tricky to use in the dark, particularly with focusing. And also I had a problem with hot pixels on the longer exposures. The reason I mentioned that this may not be ideal for sports and wildlife is purely because there's a real lack of long telephoto primes available for it. There's no 400 f2.8 or a 600 millimeter f4, for example, like there is with many other camera systems. A couple of observations, a little bit more on the negative side. I found that the battery got depleted very quickly and a couple of the shoots that I was doing had to end prematurely just because I ran out of power. And also I found the buffer speed to be quite slow. So after shooting a burst of images, uh, I had to wait a long time for those images to be written to the card. The other thing I noticed is that the RAW files, which are DNG files, don't seem to be able to be pushed as hard as other RAWs I'm used to working with. For example, not so much detail could be recovered from the shadows and the highlights. But the truth is that all the images I took, and which you have seen here, have looked great straight out of the camera, so have needed very little editing anyway. Looking at the comparison between the raw and the edited versions, there's very little change. So if you're not a fan of editing your images, this could be a real benefit to your workflow. And finally, we have to talk about the whole status element of owning a Leica. 
they turn heads in the same way that driving an Aston Martin does, which is why James Bond himself uses Leica, including in the next film, No Time to Die. Put simply, you're just gonna look cooler with one of these around your neck. Now, obviously I need no help in that department, but just saying. Was that all right? Was that kind of cool enough, butch enough? Okay, good, done. Thanks to Ford's Photographic for the loan of the equipment. Ford's are one of the main dealers for Leica gear, so they're certainly worth checking out if you fancy owning something from what is surely the most iconic and classy of camera brands out there. As usual, there's a link to their website in the section below. Now this, is hot off the press. It's our annual magazine, which is 68 pages of photography goodness, including information on all the workshops and trips that we have planned over the coming couple of years. Lots of articles too from our team of pros as they explain the stories behind some of their best images and also features some of our customers showing how they've developed their photography by opening a gallery or publishing their own book. This is already in the hands of our supporters who get a free digital version, but everyone else can now get hold of it for just two pounds. It comes as a physical copy like this, but if you want to save money on postage, then you can choose the digital option. You can get both versions by going to the relevant link down below. Alternatively, you can spend just 99 pence more and join the many viewers who help support our channel. Just press the join button if you see that below, or there's a link in the description as usual. As well as getting this for free, you also get information about upcoming shows, plus the occasional bonus video, so it's well worth checking out and helps us make better content in the future. Now, so far this year, we've been giving you wildlife tips from both the top and the bottom of the country. If you haven't already seen our past couple of shows, then you'll have missed a golden eagle shoot, deer on Dartmoor, and the very cute wee otter cub. But we don't all have those subjects accessible to us, especially at the moment when travel is so restricted. So this time in Wild Diaries, James has been hanging out in his local cemetery with a punk rocker and a loudmouth. Intrigued? I know I am. Thanks Ruth and welcome once again to Devon and this month to this beautiful old rustic cemetery where I'm going to introduce you to and show you how to go about photographing the aforementioned rocker and loudmouth. We all need an escape a place to go for some peace from time to time. And this tranquil spot fits the bill perfectly. It's a place to listen to the robin sing, a place to simply just watch nature and relax. That is until the resident local loudmouth starts up. So here is that peace shattering creature. It's diminutive in stature for sure, but pound for pound, the loudest of them all, or so it thinks anyway, it's the mighty wren. Wrens can be found across the whole of the UK. We're not belting out their songs, they are scurrying about in the undergrowth. They seem to stand so tall, they are so big for their boots. They are so full of character. They really are fabulous little things. So, to the punk rocker. Cemeteries are often renowned for their ancient yew trees and these provide the perfect habitat for Britain's smallest bird, the goldcrest. It's that remarkable splash of crest colour that makes them appear so punkish. This tiny, delicate little creature is also widespread across the UK and like the wren, tricky but great fun to try and photograph. So both these birds are small and speedy and pretty darn hard to photograph, but there is one principle that will definitely help you. It's a killing two birds with one stone kind of thing, I suppose. What is that principle? Well, it's good old routine. As with most natural creatures, both the wren and the goldcrest have habits, and we can use this behavior to our advantage. The wren will work a circuit time after time and nearly always coming to see what's going on if I appear. In fact, he will nearly always alight right here on this perch. The goldcrests will work along the outer boughs before dropping to the stones and then working their way around the trunk before briefly alighting on this branch and continuing on with their pursuit of tiny insects. 
Having sat beneath this tree on a few occasions, contemplating life, I notice this pattern of behaviour repeating time and time again. It is this repetition of routine, this predictability that makes photographing these speedy little creatures so much easier. I now know roughly where the birds are likely to be so I can be prepared to get some shots. I'm using a 100-400 and an old 5 Series Canon body, but it really doesn't matter what equipment you use, the key is learning the birds' routines. The wren and the goldcrest are both real characters and both are challenging to photograph. But don't let this put you off. Give it a try and you'll probably be rewarded with some great images of your own local punk rocker in Loudmouth. Now, let's head north by a few hundred miles to see what my colleague Harry has been getting up to this month. Thank you James. Here on Sky we are staying small and accessible. We're blessed with an amazingly varied coastline, from dramatic sea cliffs to shallow sea lochs and bays like this one. These are home to amazing charismatic wildlife like whales, dolphins, eagles, otters, but I've been staying a little more local and getting to know some of our local residents. Wander along any shallow coastal water and you're bound to come across various shore and water birds. The numbers and variety of species varies a lot over the course of a year, but there'll always be something to find. Common species include grey herons, oyster catchers, red shanks and wildfowl like geese and mallards and other ducks as well. Small shorebirds, waders and ducks might not have the excitement of an eagle thundering through the sky above you, but their delicate and intricate plumage, coupled with their abundance, make perfect photographic subjects to practice both your photographic skills, but also your fieldcraft ones. Shorebirds tend to be observant, wary and flighty, keeping their distance, which obviously makes it difficult to photograph them. There are a couple of approaches you can use to try and get close enough to get a couple of shots. The less effective method is just to walk slowly along the shoreline. If you're lucky, you might be able to approach something or catch it as it flies past you. As with any species though, the best shots are had with a more dedicated and thoughtful approach. Observing and learning is going to help you so much here. You can identify areas that the birds use more frequently than others and that gives you an idea of the best place to sit and wait. If the area you're using is tidal, what usually happens is the birds will follow a receding tide out and then get pushed back in towards you as the tide comes back in. That means we can find a spot, sit and wait for the birds to come to us. Patience is a virtue here as you need to get into position well before the tide starts to come back in. That means you can be waiting for a couple of hours sometimes, so wrap up warm, bring a hot drink and try not to fall asleep. It's easy to get frustrated as at first everything will be far away. Persistence is key. It's unlikely that your first attempt will see you getting really close and it's taken me a good few days to get to know the area and the birds and where they like to hang out. Getting close enough is the biggest hurdle, so once this is achieved, there should be ample opportunities. Simple portraits are the easiest option and they can be really effective. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a nice portrait of a bird. Look to utilize the light. Something I really enjoy doing is using backlighting and to silhouette my subjects, especially as the sun starts to go down. Making use of somewhere local like this has been really rewarding. In the UK, most people are lucky enough to be close to either bodies of water like lakes and reservoirs, rivers or canals, or our coasts. So, no excuse. Get out there and get to know your locals.
thank you to Harry and James there. They'll be back again soon with more useful wildlife photography tips, including how to ensure the best focus for the sharpest animal shots. And as Wild Diaries is sponsored by Kite Optics, who make super high quality binoculars and scopes, we'll also be giving away this amazing prize worth £249. Binoculars can be invaluable to wildlife photographers, so you definitely don't want to miss that. Make sure you're subscribed to our channel so that you get notified whenever we publish a new show. Now, we get lots of questions sent in from you guys, so thank you for being so interactive. We do try to answer everybody and we'll be addressing some of the most commonly asked questions on our future show. You've also been sending in your images in the hundreds, so many thanks for sharing these with us. We select a few at random and pass them on to one of the show's experts to get their view in the photography online surgery. This time, Dr. Nick's back in the house, so in just a moment we'll find out whether he's in a generous or critical mood. We've got another busy surgery this month, so let's open the door and bring all the patients into the waiting room. Okay, first up we've got this image from Bob Gibson. Now this is of Arbroath Harbour at sunrise. I like the idea behind this image of getting the, the sun coming up between the two walls of the harbour. However, Bob's just missed one little thing for me. It's the position of the sun. It just needs to be a bit more to the left, so it's kind of in the middle um, of the gap between the two walls of the harbour. So all Bob had to do was move maybe a two, three, four steps to the left, and it would be perfectly in the middle. Also, there's not much movement going on in the image. What I mean by that is the water is just flat and lifeless at the moment. If Bob had waited for a different height of the tide, so it was maybe coming over at least some of the rocks, if not all of them, and you could have just used a longer exposure just to have that sense of movement of the, the water coming over the rocks. But apart from that, you know, as I say, I do like the idea behind this image. Next up, we have this image by Mark Fokema. And this was, the reason I've chosen this one is actually taken on a Galaxy S7 smartphone. So it just goes to show you the quality that you can get out of phones these days. Um, not much wrong with the, the image itself. Um, the only thing for me, and I'm just being nitpicking here, is the horizon doesn't look perfectly straight to me. But apart from that, it's a really nice idea, and I say it was taken with a smartphone, so that's why I picked that one out. And next up, we have this woodland scene by Freddie Torvaldson. Now, Freddie's got this rather nice looking tree in the middle of the image, and he's framed it nicely by the bushes either side of the frame here, and used the path here to lead you into the tree. Just a couple of things which Freddie could have done to make this image a little bit stronger for me. One thing is this branch here, it just is it's encroaching into the main subject of the, the image here. And also these out of focus, I guess they're branches or ferns or something, they just really stand out for me. Um, but apart from that, really nice image. Uh, next up we have this image from Buenos Aires by George Ramirez. And what really stands out for me is the balance of the artificial and the ambient light, which George has captured perfectly. Now, if this image was captured any earlier, then the artificial light wouldn't be noticeable. And if it was captured any later, then the ambient light would be too dark and the shadows would be too deep. Just one thing, and if it was me that was taking this image, I would have taken it from a lower viewpoint so that the gap between the top of the canoe here and the bottom of the slipway was closed up, so you wouldn't have quite so much dead space. And finally, one thing which is obviously outside of George's control is the external lights of the house. The one on the left hand side is on and the one on the right is not on. Now this could easily be fixed in Photoshop but just by using the clone stamp tool and I'll just quickly show you what I mean. So I've got the clone stamp tool selected and if I just click on there and then over here and you've got something like that. Easy done. Now next up we have this image by Nigel Baines, Captured at Bed with and Steps. Now I see a lot of potential in this image, especially down here with these sea stacks. If Nigel was just able to get himself either a higher viewpoint and using a longer focal length, or even just on this ledge here, it could have made so much more with these sea stacks. And finally, although the light is actually really quite nice in this image, I can only assume that if Nigel had waited another hour or so towards, say, sunset, Assuming that the, the sun wasn't blocked by clouds in the horizon, the light would have got better. And with a stronger viewpoint, it would have just made that image so much better. And finally, and this is my standout image of the month, it's, uh, it's captured in Glen Cole, and this is by Max Taylor Grant. Now Max has actually captured this using his drone, 
and it's a stitch panel. And it's got beautiful light, um, you've got a rainbow, now who doesn't love a rainbow? But more importantly is the actual the use of the road winding up through the glen all the way through to the rainbow. And obviously the, the mountains here are beautifully lit by the side and you've got really nice cloud in the sky. Overall beautiful image for me. So that's it for this month's surgery. If you'd like your image to be featured in a future episode, all of the information will be found in the description below. Thanks Nick. I know some of the suggestions and comments will be useful to you. Please feel free to let us know what you think to any of the images in the comments section down below. It's always great to hear different opinions. Now I've already told you about our new magazine which is available but the good news does not stop there. As you know Photography Online is based here on the Isle of Skye although our parent company MC2 operates internationally running trips all over the world. We've obviously been restricted over the past year so thanks for bearing with us while we've been stuck here in one of the world's best places for photography. However, in anticipation of things starting to get back to normal soon, uh, we're adding a couple of brand new UK locations where we'll be offering one-to-one -one workshops all year round. Up to now we've only run these on Skye, the Outer Hebrides and Glencoe which are all in the northwest of Scotland. This isn't much use if you're based in the middle or the south of the UK and want to get away with your camera for the weekend so we're making it more practical for anybody who wants us to help them with their photography. We now cover the southwest which is one of the UK's most popular photo destinations, more on that in a future show and the Isle of Man which often goes under the radar of many photographers. However that might be about to change because here is our resident Isle of Man expert James Brew to show us why we should be heading there with our cameras. Sitting in the middle of the Irish Sea, right at the heart of Britain, the Isle of Man is an often overlooked island that really is a hidden gem for landscape photography. If there is one photographic location on the island which carries the tag of being unmissable, Niarbal would likely be that location. The sweeping views of the southwestern flank of the island as it drops steeply into the Irish Sea is nothing short of outstanding. From the main car parking area, it's only a very short walk down to the first photography location, if you can avoid the temptation of the tasty treats in the cafe. From the meandering road that leads down to the sea, follow the footpath that branches away at the top of the cliffs. Here you'll be presented with a breathtaking view of the full extent of the coastline. What makes this particular spot so attractive photographically is the small, quaint fisherman's cottage situated right down on the shoreline. It acts as a wonderful focal point and element to add scale into shots taken here. The extreme natural raw beauty of this location means that it's not really that affected by weather with good opportunity to shoot in pretty much any conditions. That being said, tides are a major consideration here with most of the viewpoints looking at their best during high tide. So I would personally recommend avoiding coming here during low tides when the coastline can look a lot less picturesque. Due to its westerly facing position, the light here tends to look at its best in the hours approaching sunset. And this actually applies year round, with good shooting here through the depths of winter right to the height of summer. Quite often the mountains of Morn out to the west will be silhouetted by the setting sun here, which can look fantastic and produce incredible photographic opportunities in its own right. Once finished at the first viewpoint, 
double back on yourself and continue down the road to the shoreline. Here you'll find a collection of traditional thatched cottages and fishing equipment which can be interesting subject matters in their own right. However, follow the shoreline to the south and within a matter of seconds you'll open up a second closer vantage point of the solitary fisherman's cottage, which is well worth shooting. This little cottage makes for such an endearing photographic subject. I absolutely love it. Particularly when the tide is high, like you can see behind me, you can create really powerful shots looking down the coastline here, particularly using long exposures. But could you imagine living in this? Absolutely brutal. I'm far from finished with this magnificent coastline though. This is just the starter. Come on, I'll show you the rest. From the shoreline car park, follow the uphill footpath which follows the coast to the south. This path meanders its way along the cliff line for around 600 metres before dropping steeply down through a sea of reeds to perhaps the finest beach on the entire island. This is White Beach and it's landscape photography dynamite as far as I'm concerned. It's literally got everything I could ever wish for in a seascape location. It's quiet and it's secluded. It's got a beautiful westerly orientation with regards to sunset golden hour light. And it's a location that manages to combine a really powerful backdrop that you can see behind me of the hills meeting the coastline in abrupt fashion. But with really diverse and striking foreground subjects found all the way along the length of this beach. Diverse shoreline vegetation, brilliant white pebbles and a waterfall which crashes straight onto the beach all offer potential in this area. But it's the huge, sharp, shard of black rock that punctures the middle of the beach which really steals the show here. This unusual rock formation is incredibly eye-catching and offers superb foreground potential to counter the drama of the background hills. The best side to shoot this rock from is from its northern side, which you can just see behind me here, which reveals its blade-like edge in conjunction with the coastline behind. There's also a family of little rocks around its base, which add much needed interest and look particularly good with the waves crashing around them as they are just behind me here. Now, wide angle lenses can work here, but the danger is the hills of the background will be rendered too small. They'll look like molehills. So I much prefer to stand back off this rock and shoot it with longer focal lengths to compress the scene and give a greater balance between the foreground and the background. Niarbal is quite simply one of those special seascape locations which never fails to deliver. Yet it does not get anywhere near the photographic attention it deserves. Which is strange considering it has so many different shooting angles and high quality subject matters compacted into a relatively small and easy to explore area. In simple terms, this means it's surprisingly easy to come away with truly unique landscape images. Niarbal's summits and cliffs may not be the highest, or its beaches the largest with the whitest sands. But that doesn't matter one bit. It has a beautiful, timeless, understated beauty which perfectly encapsulates the landscapes of the Isle of Man. I'm sure you'll agree that it does look like an amazing location. If you want more information about all the one-to-one -one workshops that we offer, there's a link in the usual place. Whether it be Sky, Glencoe, the Isle of Harris, Devon, Cornwall or the Isle of Man, our team of experts will get you in the right place at the right time and help you take your photography to the next level. 
So that's it for part one of this month's show, but part two is eagerly waiting to be unleashed and we'll be here in just a couple of weeks. So you don't have to wait too long for your next photography online fix. We'll be going in search of the UK's most majestic looking mountain to see if it can compete with the iconic peaks of the world. Plus we'll be bringing you another subject project where we show you how to shoot a specific subject and then invite you to give it a go. Plus I'll have some exciting news for photography online fans. Can I not just tell them now? No? Yeah. Sorry, you'll have to wait. Don't forget as well, this is hot off the press and is a steal at only two pounds, so grab a copy before they run out. And a big thanks to Fords and Kite Optics for supporting the show. You can join the gang and help support us too. Just go to the join link below, where you'll also find all the other links for everything that we've mentioned. Okay, well, the music's about to end. I've got to go until next time. Take good care, but most of all, take good photos.